I guess I shouldn't start out by saying that this is kind of weird. Okay? Just saying. Uh, <laughs> this is what I uh, tried not to do just because it's a little different. And, and I know that, like I said, I shouldn't start out that with that, should I? I don't think I need this. And if anything happened accidentally to the video to make it turn off, that's not a problem. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Let's go to um, uh, Numbers 16. Just a little bit different here, but I know it is what I'm supposed to do. It was something that God dropped in me, or part of it, the beginning of it, when Pastor Thad was teaching. And he's been teaching about our authority. So 16, number 16, verse 28, reading out the New American Standard, says, Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. Now let's go down to verse 31. This is when, and I mentioned this the other day, we've got a rebellion going on here against Moses and Aaron. It says, as he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, and their households, and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they, and all that belonged to them, went down alive to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. Whoa. All Israel who were around them fled at their outcry, for they said, The earth may swallow us up. Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Happy thoughts right there, right? That's how we're starting this evening. So we've got an earthquake and a fire. All natural occurrences, right? They occur in nature, an earthquake. That's in nature. Now, you may start a fire, but it deals with nature. I mean, it's a natural thing, right? Natural occurrences that were kind of miraculous, you think? I mean, if the earth just happened to open up and swallow them right then and there as soon as Moses quit talking, and then the fire came down and consumed the others. Let's go to Joshua 10. Verse 11. This, of course, when the five kings came against them. Verse 11. As they fled from before Israel, while they were at the descent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Israel killed with a sword. So here again we have... Hellstone, very, they were very large hailstones. Um, natural occurrence, right? It's in, from nature, natural occurrence. Perfectly timed natural occurrence, but a natural occurrence. Let's go to Judges 6. Verse 36. Here we have Gideon. It says, Then Gideon said to God, If you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and is dry on all the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. And then verse 39, because it happened, right? It was so. Verse 39, Then Gideon said to God, Do not let your anger burn against me, that I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with this fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and let there be dew on all the ground. And God did so that night. So we're dealing there with the wetness of the dew. Have you ever walked out in the morning and got your feet all wet from the dew? Especially got your pretty sandals on, guys? You know? No? Okay. Uh, but again... A natural thing. The dew is a natural thing, right? Natural currents in nature used in a miraculous way. All right. Let's go to 1 Kings 19. I 
thinking, where is she going with this? Let's go to verse 11. So here we have Elijah who has skedaddled from Jezebel after doing all those great things. He's taken off. And verse 11, so he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. So a very strong wind, strong enough to um, rend, break the mountains apart, breaking apart rocks. It was a great wind. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. And we know, of course, you know, then Elijah's hearing that still, small voice, that soft voice. But here we have a, such a strong wind that it's actually tearing apart the mountain. Natural occurrence is wind a natural occurrence used in a miraculous way, right? All this was happening just as soon as God said, hey, get over here to the mountain. And then there was an earthquake, natural occurrence. Then there was fire. You know, that's kind of, I've talked to my students. My students were very, well, kind of shocked and thrilled to hear about spontaneous combustion. <laughs> yes, and some, anyway, some people have spontaneously combusted. But that fire just suddenly, we have good, great conversations, students and I. Um, and then a smaller wind. So all of these are natural occurrences. Right? Who made the earth and everything on it, in it, around it? God did. Right? God made the earth, everything on it, around it, and in it. And he can use it as he sees fit. To work for us, for signs and wonders. And this is where, it's, it's a little different, but this is where I'm going. And I, I, I kind of, what makes me a little bit nervous, and I know that this is where I'm going, and I know because the enemy keeps telling me that this is stupid and I shouldn't do it, and I, I knew how it came that it is the right thing, what I'm supposed to do. But Pastor Thad's been teaching about our authority, right? And he's used Joshua 10 and the sun and the moon standing still. That Joshua, a man just like us, said, and, and what the Hebrew is, it's like cease working. Sun cease working. Moon cease working. So however it came about, whether God slowed down the rotation of the earth, and there's, it is such an interesting account because the enemy, how they worship the sun and all of the signs to them of what happened here, where it was, the time of day it was, the day it happened was a sign to the enemy, the Amorites, that they were doomed, that they were done, they were toast. Every part of it. And it's so interesting. But Joshua, a man, and Pastor Thad used this, and I, and I love, Joshua's one of my favorite people. I mean, he left nothing undone, even of what God commanded Moses. I mean, he is such a cool guy. And here he is who says, cease working, cease working, stay where you're at. And his authority, and God caused that to happen in nature, it was a natural event. Some people think it was a solar eclipse, but the time of day is all wrong, or a lunar eclipse, however it was. But it's still a natural event. It dealt with the earth. So if how that happened, that the earth slowed its rotation enough to make it almost double the day without harming things on earth, or however, or however we did it, right? Because we know the sun does not rotate around us. Some people say, well, that's just silly because why would Joshua say it like that? It couldn't be true. It's like how long ago do people still believe the earth was flat, let alone that the sun rotates around us? So... So here we have that man, and it, I was just sitting there, and I just love this. I love this, and I'm always in awe of this, of him in front of everybody going, cease working. Stay right there. 
cease working, stay right there. And it happened. And as I told you in one of the offerings, I mean, there are accounts through ancient civilizations of a day almost doubled in, in different accounts in, in, in Chinese. I mean, just all sorts of accounts, Babylonians, uh, that this happened. And I'm thinking, this is just so awesome. We have that authority. Joshua did it out of his authority, and God listened to him, and and he was dealing with things of nature. This was things of nature, because Pastor Thad, you know, and he he texted the other uh, the other day and was bragging, not but he was bragging on God's what he's doing. Okay, about yeah, it was supposed to rain and we were going to get ice cream, but I told it to stop. You can you can rain in ten minutes, and he said it's got about two more minutes before it starts raining. Okay, I mean. And, you know, he's like, Jessica's dad doesn't really believe that. I said, you're just going to show off God this whole trip because he's going to do it every time it's going to do that. That's the same authority Joshua had when he said, cease working, cease working. That when he spoke to the tornado, we've, and that same, that same time, we were all at our house. Bridget was with me. She came down because she was in an um, apartment and I was out in the yard doing the same thing. You get out. There's a video recording in West Liberty of a lady in Ezel speaking in tongues to it. Whoop. So, and I know we've spoken to what we've spoken to things. And what we have spoken has come to pass. But sometimes when we think about it, or, or some people think, wow. You know, but the sun and the moon and Joshua, that's, that's a Bible story. That was in Bible times. That's when Joshua had to lead the children of Israel out, and, and this was, you know, or before, and Moses, and, and all this. And it was, so we kind of go, well, that side of the Bible doesn't really happen like that today. Well, have any of us ever told the sun to cease working and the moon to cease working and really, really believed it? I haven't. Right? So that's where I'm, I'm wanting to go here, is how awesome is that we have that authority. But sometimes, many times, our flesh gets in the way and says, ah, you know, we don't know, that's just a Bible story, or... That we don't know that that really happened. I mean, uh, Noah's flood was that really over the whole earth, or was it just the biblical earth, or you know, the prophetic earth part of the earth, which is the Middle East? And and everybody has all of these ideas and things of why they didn't happen or the accounts are wrong. So that's what I want to look at. I want to look at some events in the natural. Natural events that were used unnaturally in a miraculous way. And one thing that Billy Brim says, and I, I totally agree with, is that true science backs up the Bible every time. True science. Not made up, you know, we, but true science backs up the Bible. So, and that's what I'm wanting to look at here. So this... Um, and one thing I want to make sure of, this is not in any way, shape, or form making God less in this. That, that's one of my, my heart is like, Lord, what if anyone that hears this thinks that because the earthquake, the perfectly timed earthquake that swallowed up, Korah and all of them who were against Moses and Aaron, they were rebelling, they were, you know, the fire falling, the red, all of those things. It's like, this is such, wow, what an awesome God. What an awesome God. So this is all about God and the greatness <laughs> of our God. And here in a minute, we're going to look at some lyrics that were sung tonight. The greatness, I was just over there just getting so happy. I'm like, yes, Lord, thank you. The greatness of our God, of what he has done. He made the earth and everything on it, in it, around it. And he uses that for us. And he uses it for signs and wonders. So 
Let's look at some events when God used natural processes to make a way and when true science backs up the Bible. I love it when true science backs up the Bible. Now, we're not going to go here because I don't plan on taking forever, but let's talk about the flood, Noah's flood. There's, and I remember having an argument with my dad years ago. I don't remember what it was, but it was something about the, the flood didn't happen. And I'm like, this proves the flood happened. You just think about our area in the caves, Mammoth Caves, and so much of Kentucky, the limestone. And you know what you find in, those, in the limestone? Fossils of, yep, all these little sea creatures. Hmm. Kentucky was completely underwater. That's what you find. Um, so many of the things, the fossils, and it shows a rapid burial. There's a layer in the fossil layer that is from a rapid burial, like 40 days of water. There is... I don't know what I wrote there. The plate tectonics, the shifting, and the, and I cannot go into it with you. I didn't bring notes to read about that because I was kind of like, what? And to try to recount much of that is like, what? I, and I love earth science, but it was way beyond me. Just the subduction and all of these things that proves that there was major movement. Our plates in the crust shift all the time. It's how we, the earthquakes, they shift in volcanic activity. They shift all the time, but not to the degree that they once did at one time in the Earth's history. Um, the shifting of the continents from Pangaea to our continents. Uh, huge amounts of sediment dumped into the ocean basins from the draining of the water. And it's at certain layers and at certain spots. It's not recent None of these things, there's not been anything else like it in centuries, millennia. And there's so much of the evidence, and I always just think about that. And I have rocks. I have some rocks from up behind our house in Lewis County where I grew up with have a little uh, mussel, some sort of little seashell in it that we found up there. So there's so much evidence that this was, I'd even heard before years ago, and I don't know, I didn't find it anywhere, but they even think that possibly the flood is what shifted the earth on its axis. It's, you know, it's, it's that tilt from all of the water, the flood. So there's so much evidence that there is, there was a flood that covered the whole earth, not just the biblical, not just in, in that area, but the whole earth. And it's scientific evidence. I mean, there's so much archaeological evidence to show that just from the shifting of and, you know, the fossils found from dinosaurs on the op different continents where it's, there was no way, other way for them to get in the different spots. So there's lots of scientific evidence that backs up Noah's flood. A lot of, I mean, because you think, and I don't know how many people really even Christians who question that, when you do research, you find the oddest things that Christians accept. That's one thing. It's like, well, I really do believe in this sort of evolution. I believe in evolution to the extent that we all evolve. We change. I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago. Right. I mean, we don't, I didn't come from muck, but I'm different than I used to be. Um, people or humans are taller than they used to be, longer lives than they used to be. I mean, so there is, things change. Evolutionists change. So when I, it's like I don't believe in, I, I used to be a monkey. <laughs> Monkey's uncle. Anyway, but science backs up that kind of change. That, I mean, how will you? Anyway. All right, let's go to Exodus 14. But, I mean, people who are, yes, I believe in evolution, and I'm a Christian, and I believe we came from muck. It's like, do you not read Genesis? Do you leave out the Old Testament? Probably. Exodus 14, 
I, and here's an account. This and I, they're not just stories. The Bible is just like I said the other day. Josh, the book of Joshua is a is a book of history. It's historical account. It is not figurative. It's not poetic. It's literal. And there's so much of the Bible that people think is is not literal, but it is. So, and here we have a literal event, and there is evidence to back this up, scientific evidence to back this up. And this is, this is really cool. So here we have where they're crossing. They're stuck at the Red Sea. Verse 20. Well, let's go to verse 19. The angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness. Yet it gave light at night. Thus the one did not come near the other all night. Then, most, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind. Did we hear about a strong wind any time when after I started speaking? Elijah on the mountain, the strong wind that actually was rending the mountain. By a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land so the waters were divided. And some um, translation says drove the sea back. Now, that word strong is mighty, powerful, roughly, fiercely. So it was an intense wind in the 60 miles per hour range. Okay, 60, 60... How do we know that that's possibly how fast the wind was blowing? Well, there's scientific evidence to back this up. So in the winter of 1882, I did need this. There was a British Army officer who um, he was on a lake stationed there, and he noticed something when he went out. Oh, crud. That morning, he, and I deleted the picture. Okay. So he came out and he saw that this body of water, and it was 1882. He couldn't see the water anywhere. It was a large lake, a sea. He went out and he saw just this, the land, no water. And he said he stood there and looked at it. Everything was drying up. It stayed that way for almost 24 hours. And he wrote that he was reminded, he said, I realized what I was looking at could have been what they were looking at when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. So there's several people who study the weather, study the water. Um, and so there is this theory that it's from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the University of Colorado, and they have several theories. They believe wind could have parted the Red Sea from Moses. A strong east wind that blew through the night could have pushed the wa waters back in. Computer simulations, part of a larger study on how winds affect water, show wind could push water back at a point where a river bent to merge with a lagoon um, would just take the water away. The simulations match fairly closely with the account in Exodus. The parting of the waters can be understood through fluid dynamics. The wind moves the water in a way that's in accordance with physical laws, creating a safe passage with water on two sides and then abruptly allowing the water to rush back in. So, and there's several scientists, and they also, one, and I, we don't know exactly where they crossed the Red Sea. There's even accounts, you know, people saying it was the Sea of Reeds that they crossed, so it was shallow and it was, wouldn't be a big deal. But they've also found uh, a levee under the sea, uh, in the Red Sea, that if they crossed at that point, it's only six feet deep, and for this which this gentleman in 1882 experienced it. It's a, it has happened a few, time, few times in the world's history. Um, 
when he went out, the water was gone, that this strong east wind blowing the water back would leave the levee, which is only under six feet of water, totally exposed and dried, and that on either side would be the 5,000 to 6,000 feet deep part of the Red Sea. Because honestly, if it had been any other part, they would have had a very difficult time going through it because it is a major drop and back up. So here we have, you know, and of course you have your naysayers that are like, well, but there's quite a bit of evidence that if this, this is the spot where they crossed, that this meteorological occurrence, this occurrence in nature that does happen, that has happened again, parted the Red Sea, and they're like, well, Moses didn't part the Red Sea. You know, it's really tricky timing there, wasn't it? Held out the staff. The east wind blew. It blew all night. That's one thing in the account. Some, when I was a kid, I didn't realize. He held out the staff. They did their thing, and all night long, that east wind blew. So that was pretty tricky timing for it not to have anything to do with Moses and with God. And that's what so many people say. Well, Moses didn't do it. It wasn't God. This is a natural occurrence. And I just went through a bunch of natural occurrences, didn't I? The earth, earthquake swallowing up a bunch of people and then closing back. Um, fire rain coming down. You've got the dew dry here but wet there. And now that's wet there but dry here. All of those things that are natural occurrences that was used in a miraculous way. That's only God. Yeah, there can be earthquakes all the time, but a perfectly timed earthquake, as soon as Moses stopped speaking to swallow up a whole bunch of people and then close back up. So then um, it shows, this model shows a wind of 63 miles per hour blowing steadily for 12 hours. It blew all night could have pushed back water six feet deep. And this land bridge in the Red Sea, two and a half miles long, three miles wide, and it remains open for four hours. That's what they've calculated scientifically that it would have remained open for, And this, if this is the spot. And then what else have they found? Chariot wheels plated with gold. Uh, and I have to read you this part. It says, at one point, they have TV crews in there. There are pictures. They have found a lot of things in this spot with that little land bridge, they call it, the levee, right in this area. And this is, this is funny. It says, at one point, the TV crew and the scientists investigated the bottom of the Red Sea. And weirdly, they came across dozens of ancient Egyptian relics belonging to the Egyptian army. Hmm, weirdly. They found photo golden chariots and fossilized human and horse bones on the bottom of the seabed. That was weird, wasn't it, that they found that there? But it had nothing to do with God. Uh, it says, due to strong beliefs in religion at that time, the weird phenomena would have undoubtedly been credited to God and thus documented as if God had indeed conducted the miraculous acts. You have to work hard. To be an unbelief, in unbelief with this stuff. I was going to say you have to work hard to be stupid, but you really don't. But you have to work hard to really take this. And weirdly, they found lots of Egyptian relics. They found a lot of fossilized bones from being down there so long. They were actually, um, had the, how tall the men were, uh, the and the wheels on the chariots, they can't move because they'll disintegrate because they were plated with gold. And, and it's so they could find them pretty easily. There are pictures. There are people, you know. So they and it was all in this one area where instead of being 5,000 to 60,000 feet deep, it's a little levee underneath. It's like going out to Paragon Tunnel and walking on the road, you know. And people think you're walking on water out there. So this is another thing. <laughs> God used natural things to prove out his word, used in an unnatural, miraculous way. And how you could think that, weirdly, all this stuff is here, but it had nothing to do with God. God made the earth. 
God made the Red Sea. God made that levee under the water. When he formed the earth just so they could walk across it. Now think about that. Think about how God prepared things. Think about how God shows off in this ph- these phenomena. Think about how it meteorologically can occur that a 60-some mile per hour wind, and if the water's just right and the curve of how it is, will blow the water back and you could cross on dry ground. That God made it like that. Now, does that take anything away from God saying this was a natural occurrence? Absolutely not. God made, he uses everything on earth, in the earth, around the earth for us. He had that ready to roll. Well, they're going to do this. I know the end from the beginning, right? Where they're going to do this and we're going to come here and we're going to show everybody. And the Egyptians will be wiped out and never bother them again, that army, because they would have chased them to no end. That's how good God is. That's how great God is, that he made this so far ahead of time. He knew what he was going to do. Well, let's go to um, Joshua 4. I just want to get in us... You know, these things, these accounts in the Bible, and I won't call them stories, these accounts in the Bible, this is history. This is history of the earth. These are real occurrences. Now, there, there's lots of poetic things, and depending on what books you're looking at, and as uh, figurative language, but this was an occurrence. And even like Noah's, the flood, there were accounts handed down in quite a few different cultures about a global flood. And we have so much scientific evidence. It happened. The crossing of the Red Sea, it happened. If nothing, I mean, we have physical evidence at the bottom of the Red Sea close to that area where this is, I mean, it's scientific. This is where it came from, dated to that time period. These are people who are not even, they're not believing that have dated. A lot of these things that have been found and have been dated are not by believers. Like, well, we still can't say it really happened, but this would be kind of a cool sign. So, and I just want us to see that, that we can think about in our authority. Moses did hold the, he did what God said to do. That authority he had that God gave him to do and God working with with nature that he made caused that to happen. We have that kind of authority. We have the authority, cease working, cease working. Joshua 4, verse 16, here we go into the crossing of the Red Sea. Or, I'm sorry, Jordan, crossing of the Jordan. Um, this is really cool too. Verse, well, let's go to verse, yes, it's 16. It says, command the priests who carry the Ark of the Testimony that they come up from the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, saying, Come up from the Jordan. It came about when the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had come up from the middle of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place. So, and then where, when they stepped in it, the waters, well, how could that happen? That really couldn't have happened. How could that possibly happen? Is there any scientific evidence that that could have, you know, eh, you know, it's just a made-up story, right? Well... There's scientific evidence. Um, The banks of the Jordan. Let's see. Here we go. Now, this is from a Scottish Egyptologist and archaeologist. Said the river's flow stopped, leaving a dry crossing, as the waters had piled up at a town near Adam. This phenomenon directly reflects known reality and is not fantasy. This is an Egyptologist and archaeologist. Some 16 miles north of a crossing opposite Jericho. Remember, this is where they're opposite of Jericho. Adam, which is mentioned in its present day Tel Edomea. It is specifically in this district that the high banks of the Jordan have been liable to periodic collapses. Sufficient, now is this what happened? Sufficient to block the river for a time. Thus, in December A.D. 1267, 
A high mound by the river collapsed into it, stopping its flow completely for 16 hours. In 1906, a similar event occurred, and then during the earthquake in 1927. That time, the West Bank collapsed, taking the road with it, while just below this is a 150-foot section of Riverside Cliff, Cliff fell across the river, damming it completely for 24 hours. Such an event in antiquity would have readily facilitated the crossing by the early Israelites. And then you have another, ar another archaeologist. Historically known quakes have dammed the Jordan River repeatedly. Does this say that God didn't do it? Am I saying God did not? No. I'm saying God uses, as we looked at all through the Bible, uses natural occurrences because it, really, wow, some huge coincidences, right? That this just happened to happen. Stick your foot in there. I mean, so many people, well, that's a coincidence. Garbage. I mean, some people said that the Red Sea was because Moses knew the tides. The tide that split the sea? Come on, that's some tide. I mean, I, so all of this is backing up that God, the greatness of our God, he is an awesome God. He uses these natural things. So, And we have authority over natural things, just like our pastor uses authority over the weather. Historically known quakes have dammed the Jordan River repeatedly, sometimes for several days. Now, this isn't something that happens every day. Let me give you the dates of these. It doesn't happen every day. So we can't say, well, they knew this was going to happen. They'd been watching it, and they knew, you know, it's about time for one. We're going over here and looking at the other bank. And, oh, it's starting to crack a little bit right there. We think this is going to happen. And wait, don't put your foot in yet. Don't put your foot, right? That would take a lot of work for that to happen. So here are the times. In 1160, 1267, these are years. So from 1160 to 1267, a couple hundred years, or a hundred years. I'm retired. I don't have to do math anymore. 1534, 1834, 300 years later. 1906, and then one just a few years later because of the earthquake, 1927. These are documented. I mean, they know this from archaeological excavations, different things, that this didn't happen every day. But it was a natural, could that be why the Jordan River and piled up? Because, remember, Jericho could see it, that it was dammed from a bank. Because I always wondered, well, how did the water just pile up on itself? I mean, I'm this person, okay? This is why this stuff thrills me. And, and I'm going, Lord, I don't know that it thrills anybody else, and why would they want to know it, but I know this is what you're having me do. But it does, because I've always thought, well, how did, how did the water stack? How did it stack up on itself? Well, if it's dammed up, it's going to stack up. Is that what God did to do it? I don't know. But I know that true science will back up the Bible every time. And you have heathens who are saying some of these things. All right? So we had perfect timing, perfect timing for this. It was Just think about the timing. And this is God leaving clues. Oh, I want to read this too because this is awesome. It says, The fact that the river was stopped by an earthquake and mudslide does not in any way undermine the Bible's giving God the credit for it. There is nothing wrong with thinking that at least some of the Old Testament wonders may have involved natural processes over which the Lord exercised dramatic sovereign control. Mudslides damming the Jordan River did not happen every day. From what we can tell, such an event happens there on an average once every couple of centuries or so. Yet the river was stopped at just the right time for the Israelites to cross over into the Promised Land and march on Jericho. Ironically, by using such natural processes to bring about some of his dramatic provisions for the people of Israel, God left behind clues to the veracity of the biblical accounts that we can examine and verify millennium later. Now, and here again, I'm a faith person. I don't really have to know how the water stacks up to believe that it's stacked up. 
I just have one of those minds going, well, how did it stack up? How did it just stack so that they could see it? Because faith is faith. I mean, you, you don't have to know and how that miracle was done. You don't have to. You just know that God did it, that it was, was done. But I love the fact when God does something like that, that then science backs up. Oh, that's how. And, it, and you really have to work hard to not believe it, which some many people do. Now let's go to Joshua well, it's verse tw- chapter 6, verse 20. Here's one. We've got the walls of Jericho falling. Um, they've walked around it. They're shouting. It says, so the people shouted, 620. So the people shouted and priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat. So the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. Now they also burned everything within it. Okay. Of course they got out Rahab and all of her family, all of her, excuse me, all her household, all of her things. Um, and burned everything within it. Now, and this is something that's been discovered for quite some time, but there are, uh, I think it was in the 1990s, there was a group of people that went in. They were Italian, and they were with, I don't know all of the people. They're not the Jews, but... Palestinian or whatever, went in there and came out and said, we found absolutely no evidence that any of that was true. And then uh, another man went in later and actually f- took pictures with the evidence that actually proved more of the, Jericho- the biblical account than what anybody else had. But so the original Hebrew wording, when it talks about Jericho falling down, carries the idea of the walls falling below themselves. So they have a retaining wall, but they fall below themselves. And this is consistent with what they found. It says, A deposit of collapsed mud brick was found at the base of the retaining wall at certain locations around the tail, the outside. This is surprisingly, this is not a believer writing this. This is surprisingly consistent with the account in the book of Joshua. This collapsed wall would have also created a ramp for the Israelite warriors to march up the embankment to take the city because of the way the walls were built, because of what they had down here. I can't remember what they're called, and it doesn't matter, but it kind of, when it fell, it didn't just go down, it went down. Um. The archaeological record makes the biblical account surprisingly believable. It supports the idea that the walls tumbled below themselves as well as the statement that the Israelites went up to take the city. During an early excavation in 1907 to 1909, German archaeologists found that although most of the wall had collapsed, a portion of the wall had not entirely collapsed and have and appeared to have been preserved. I wonder why it it lasted when so much of the wall, it was mud, brick, just just disintegrated over all this time, but it was still there. Huh. They also found evidence that houses had been built along the wall. These houses typically had a thickness of only one brick, suggesting they were built for the poorer inhabitants of the city. Although this may not have been the location of Rahab's house, it is consistent with the biblical narrative. Again, not a believer writing it. Another detail that is also of interest in the archaeological site of Jericho is the presence of pots of charred grain. There was evidence of so many things being burnt that were burned from when the city was attacked and destroyed. What is unusual about these grain pots is that the grain would probably have been eaten during a siege if it had been prolonged over a long period of time. The siege of Jericho by the ancient Israelites is said to have lasted only seven days. The fact that the grain pots were still full is consistent with a short siege. 
This also supports another part of the biblical narrative, which mentions that the Battle of Jericho happened in the spring, shortly after harvest time. So, you know, they walk around, they shout, earthquake? be perfect timing, wouldn't it? And that just makes me, God's timing is perfect, no matter how much we want it. (laughs) And sometimes we delay things, but oh my goodness, think about all the timing of what God put into place. And again, true science backs up the Bible. And that's why it was just, like I said, really this was such a weird topic for me to teach you. This is not weird for me to study. I love this. I have an archaeological Bible that I go through, and it, and it talks about, and they are believers, and it gives information about the cities and the locations and all of these things. I love that kind of stuff because I like learning, and I am a believer, and I believe things that I've never seen. I, I, I mean, so many things, but I love having this kind of thing opened up to me to go, uh huh. Uh, Joshua was like me. Moses was like me. Well, I mean, they were very obedient. Am I that obedient? You know, Gideon, look what happened here. Look at them talking, speaking to nature, and look what happens. <laughs> Elijah, whack the Jordan River. How many times? Boop, they walk across. I mean, think about what they, and this is. This is not just nursery rhymes or fairy tales. This is history. This is, these are things that happened. These are things that normal people did and were a part of. These are things that God put into place when he formed the earth. He, he made all the cycles within the earth. I, I mean, just when he, he made all these, nat- the way... The crust is made, and how the earthquakes can happen, and just it's just fascinating and wonderful. Go ahead and put up that song. I just it was perfect, and I thought I got to have this put up because this is this is just who God is. I mean, when you think about it, the greatness of our God. This is a God who formed all these things, who uses nature in an unnatural way, in a miraculous way, from the dawn of creation. He set into place everything that was going to be needed to get out of Egypt for, I mean, everything, for going into the promised land, everything. Jesus, everything, from the dawn of creation. I love that he had that. (laughs) The Red Sea is very deep. That is the only spot they really could have because going down the... It was very steep incline in the deepest part. And to have this part be like just covered in six feet of water. And then you have this meteorological event that can just happen overnight. And someone, right? From the dawn of creation, this world has been crying out for hope, for a hero to save us. We long for the supernatural. (laughs) Supernatural. The natural, God uses the natural in an unnatural way. Go ahead. Only one God who can save the day. (laughs) Every time we have these events, and there's so many more, God saving the day with through men and women just like us. Using nature. Clear the stage, prepare the way, because heaven and earth are singing. Let the whole world see the greatness of our God. Did all of Egypt see the greatness of our God? Yes, they sure did. They did in in multiple ways. (laughs) Telling them finally to get out of here and take your God with you. Leave us be. But then going out, I mean, so many ways. The greatness of our God. Jericho, straightly shut up. They were terrified. They had their supply ready to eat for a long siege inside the the walls because they saw the water stacked up. I mean, all of these things that God used, uh, earthquakes swallowing up, you know, I don't want anybody, okay, I'm, I've not really thought about having anybody swallowed up by an earthquake. 
not really lately. Anyway, so, but all of these things, I, I would have, I'm thinking, I, I should have been there. A skillet. Go ahead to the, an awesome wonder. He reigns forever. This, this, all this tonight, because I did, I'm like, Lord, I can't have anybody hearing this, whether seeing it there, anybody hearing this think that I'm, I'm dissing God in any way. Because just like that one guy, it was hilarious, this one guy, you know, well, weirdly, they found all sorts of their stuff and their bones and the chariots, you know, but because of the time, they just would have said it was God. Duh! Who else? There's too much perfect timing in the Bible. I mean, even catching the fish with the coin in its mouth, right? Go, go, catch, go fishing. Pay the taxes. All of these things. God had that fish ready. From the beginning of creation. All of that. He reigns forever. We know the greatness of our God. This is, I love, I love, well, I love the newsboys anyway, but this is great. How great is he? Go ahead and stand with me because I'm actually done. I just got to quit talking. Because how do I end that up? And, And I hope that you're seeing what I saw and that, but, you know, I, I think a lot about how people in the world or people who've been in church um, for so long and, and you, maybe you're not seeing things that, you know, well, Elisa said, all oh, you know, it's been forever now. They've been talking this stuff or that stuff or we're not we're not seeing. Well, where I've not seen anybody's leg grow back out or baby, you know, his arms and legs pop back out after like hey, 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 Alan kicked him. Whatever, I'm not, we're not seeing that. So is the Bible really, I mean, that's the Bible, but, 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 but nothing. This is God. This is who God is, that he's got it set for you. He's ready and waiting for you to use your authority. Just like, I mean, smack the Jordan. Have it part for you. Amen. No matter how, if nature is used to do it. And again, we don't have to know how every miracle happened. I don't have to know how everything in the Bible happened. But it's really cool, and I like what that one guy said, that God was leaving clues. He left us clues. Unbelievers. Eh, you see this clue? That's pretty much, how, how are you going to explain that one? Well, weirdly, it I just can't get over that. Weirdly, they found all sorts of bones and chariots, and but, you know, I don't know. They're just going to say it was God. Yeah. Let me get a skillet and crack you upside the head and maybe see if you start thinking right. <laughs> Amen. So, hallelujah. I, I just end it, Lord, with just saying thank you. I thank you for the word that you gave me. I know that it was what I was supposed to give because just the way you make things plain. And, Father, I open our eyes and our hearts. Holy Spirit, lead us into seeing what you see, into all those little coincidences that are not, that it's just the perfect timing, just the right time, And it is the right time to use our authority. And yeah, (laughs) like Joshua did it in front of everybody. Whoa. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you the glory. We give you the glory for it all. And you're such a great God. We love you, Lord. Amen.